Good morning. It is truly a blessing and honor to be amongst uh, God's people. Before we begin, I would like to make a few announcements. I encourage everyone to join us this Wednesday. Our brother Robert Atkins is going to be doing a series on evangelism uh, in the month of March, and it's going to be very good. He's uh, shown us a few of his materials, and so I encourage each and every one of you to join us uh, this Wednesday at 7 p.m., at 7 p.m. Also, I want to let you know that we're going to be going through a series of Christian and his influence. This morning, we're going to be looking at the Christian and his influence in the community. Next week, we're going to be looking at the Christian and his influence on the job. After that, the Christian and his influence in the home and in the local church. So how important is the Christian's influence in the community? Very. Folks, it has been said that a Christian's conduct often speaks louder to the world than their doctrine. You know, I couldn't agree more with this statement. Because when it comes to how we behave, our character speaks louder than our religious beliefs. Most people in the community, my friends, judge the church by the individual members and by the lives they live. In other words, my friends, how we carry ourselves is a reflection of the church. As Christians, it is our responsibility to live in such a way that doesn't bring reproach upon his name. We must be above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Brothers and sisters, it is our duty to appear as lights in the world. You know, a friend of mine once said, Jesus' kingdom exists on earth not to coexist. His kingdom exists to shine his light in a way that offers hope and truth to those in darkness. That's why his kingdom exists. So how can we influence the community if our lives don't reflect the image of Christ? You know, I was doing some research uh, in regards to the population in Gastonia, and there are approximately 77,000 people in Gastonia. But catch this, it's one church of Christ. Yes, this may seem like a burden. Yes, this task may seem daunting, but the souls are great. The harvest is plentiful. But it's up to us to make sure that our influence permeates the community with the gospel. So I want us to look at two points this morning. Habits that a Christian should practice to exert good influence in the community. And then I want us to look at ways that we can exercise good influence in the community. So when it comes to habits that a Christian should practice to exert good influence in the community, First, let me tell you, we must live out our religious beliefs. We must practice what we profess. <clears throat> to have a profound impact on the community, my friends, we must be committed to practicing what we preach and living what we believe. We must prove our profession that we are Christians by our conduct. When you consider the life of Christ, he lived what he taught. He taught on humility, forgiveness, love without discrimination, and holiness. Folks, our Lord embodied these characteristics. With regard to humility, a good example of this is found in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8. Turn over to Philippians chapter 2 for me. Look at verses 3 through 8. The Apostle Paul says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind. Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality 
quality got a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Folks, humility means to value others above yourself. We see that here in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8, with Jesus Christ coming down and dying on the cross for us. But when it comes to forgiveness, you see, our Lord said these words. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Now, this divine statement refers to those who mocked him, beat him, flogged, and crucified him. What a powerful example of forgiveness here mentioned that we should imitate as Christians in a world that teaches to get even. But when it comes to love without discrimination, my friends, our Lord taught that we should love everyone, even our enemies. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through, 40, 43 through 45, our Lord said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. But when it comes to holiness, our Lord lived a holy life. And he expects his followers to do the same, to live holy and blameless in this world. You turn over to Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, 14 rather, teaches for the grace of God has appeared to all men, bringing, the grace of God has appeared to all men, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness, worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possessions, zealous for good works. Holiness. You know, just the other day, I got a phone call from a, a brother in Christ who, who told me about a coworker that he's been studying with. And he said this coworker would invite him to the bar on Fridays and to go have drinks, to hang out. But our brother declined. He turned down the invitation. Simply so that he could let his light shine. But folks, let me tell you, our brother's conduct led to a Bible study, led him to have a Bible study rather. And yesterday, he was baptized. His co-worker was baptized into Christ. And it all stemmed from our brother living and conducting himself and conducting himself as he should. Church, if we don't live what we advocate to the world, we will soon lose respect and our influence in the community will be weak. <clears throat> Folks, there is no respect for a hypocritical Christian. A Christian that doesn't practice humility, forgiveness, love, and holiness will lose their influence. How can we impact the community if we aren't allowing his word to change and impact our lives? Brother Wendell Winkler said, if you want your neighbor to see what Christ can do for him, let him see what Christ has done for you. If your life doesn't demonstrate the life of Christ, it is going to be hard to exert good influence. If your life does not display humility, forgiveness, love, and holiness, it's going to be hard for you to influence the community and your neighbors. It's going to be hard for you to uh, try to get a Bible study because they're going to look at you as a hypocrite, someone who does not practice what they preach. So brothers and sisters, we must practice what we profess 
in this world. And that leads to this point here. The Christian must also portray a friendly disposition. Yes, we must live what we teach, but we also must portray a friendly disposition. Our attitudes toward people must be welcoming. We should display a friendly disposition at restaurants, grocery stores, the gym, ball games, the barber shop, beauty salon, hair salons, uh, nail salons, the doctor's office, dentist's office, you name it. Wherever we go, it is important that we have an inviting attitude and an attitude that is caring, loving, and kind. If you look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12, the Apostle Paul says those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Folks, the word put on literally means clothe yourselves with. Make sure that these attributes reside in your heart. But the word kindness, my friends, denotes a heart that is compassionate, sympathetic, gentle, and friendly. This is something that should be on full display in our lives. Jesus is the best example of kindness. Why? Because he is kindness. His life epitomized kindness. He is the embodiment of kindness, and he is the source of our kindness. You think about how he spoke and dealt with people. My friends, we ought to do the same. As Christians, we shouldn't be standoffish. We shouldn't be snobby, rude, inconsiderate, or apathetic, because these characteristics hinder our Christian influence. So let me ask you, how do you carry yourselves in the community? How do you carry yourself in the community when you go places? Are you friendly? When the waiter messes up your order, how do you respond? Do you speak to the cashier at the checkout line? Are you inviting? Folks, it's been said that a cold shoulder does not attract warm friends. And there is no doubt in my mind that if we display a friendly and kind disposition, doors will open up for us to share the gospel of Christ. But we have to remember to be kind just as he, is, he was kind. But not only that, my friends, the Christian must watch their speech as well. If we want to influence the community, we must watch our speech. Brothers and sisters, it is vital that we are mindful of the words we speak, that we watch what comes out of our mouths. Cursing, unwholesome joking, filthy speech, idle words, backbiting, fault finding, and such like must not be named among the children of God. I want you to consider these verses here. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 29, the apostle Paul says, let no unwholesome words proceed from your mouth. If you turn over to Psalm chapter 34, look at verse 13. The psalmist says, keep your tongue from evil. But then in Psalms 141 in verse, thir in verse 3, the psalmist says, set a guard over my mouth, O Lord, and keep watch over the door of my lips. Folks, if we are going to identify ourselves as God's children, let me tell you, we must speak as God's children. I submit to you, my friends, if we want to maintain our good influence as the church, we must abstain from offensive language. When we get around family, friends, and even our neighbors, especially when we have visitors coming into the congregation, we cannot sit up and gossip about one another. We have to be careful about what we say because what we say can potentially ruin our reputation. We don't want to taint our influence. I know of an incident where a couple was visiting the Lord's church. And someone in that church, in that congregation, made a comment that, was, that wasn't right. And that family never returned. The wife was a Christian, but the husband was not. Folks, if we aren't careful about what we, what we say, 
people will make comments such as, aren't you supposed to be a Christian? Christians don't use that type of language. They may say things like, that's not Christ-like, or I can't believe you, out of all people would say something like that. Don't you go to church? We've heard these comments before. But folks, the Bible teaches that we are a peculiar people, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And as peculiar people, we are to portray ourselves as those set apart from the world's way of being. Even under the old covenant, the children of Israel were instructed to live differently than the surrounding nations. Folks, God takes our conduct seriously. We are representations of him, of Christ. Everything we say is being observed. And believe it or not, there are some people looking for reasons to slander the name of Christ. And we can't give them a reason. Our speech should be above reproach because we don't want people to malign the name of God. So instead of using our tongues for evil, how about we use them for good? Instead of gossiping, uh, telling inappropriate jokes, or cursing, rather, how about we invite that coworker who is struggling to have a Bible study? How about we tell a friend or family member to attend service and use what God has blessed us with for his glory? Folks, it is very important that we are mindful of our conduct, our behavior, the way we carry ourselves in the community. You think about the numbers, 77,000 people in Gastonia, one church of Christ. Yes, there is work to be done, but it starts with you as an individual. It starts with your conduct, your behavior, how you're carrying yourself. Are you living like Christ? Are you humble? Are you forgiving? Are you loving? Are you living righteously? Are you friendly when you go places? And are you mindful of the things that come out of your mouth when you are around certain individuals? You see, oftentimes people wonder, why is it? Why is it that I can't get a Bible study with this family member or this friend? Why is it? Well, you have to look at yourself first. Got to look at yourself. And you have to ask yourself the question, have I been living according to the scriptures? Folks, let me tell you, you may hear me say this a lot. They're watching. They're watching. And the more we live as Christians, the more we imitate Christ and his character, the better off we will be when it comes to winning souls in the community. We are not going to win souls by living like the world. It's not going to happen. We have to be set apart as God's children. You're not going to win your coworker over by engaging in unwholesome speech and joining in on certain jokes that are not fit for a Christian. You're not going to win them that way. You're not going to win that family member over by harboring a grudge, by speaking ill of someone else. You're not going to win them over that way. You're not going to win that spouse over to Christianity, if you will, if you're not living holy. Or that boyfriend. You're not going to win them that way. You have to stay in line with scripture if you want to win souls for Jesus. It's that simple. You look at the Christians in the first and second century in the book of Acts. Their character was in line with Christ. 
So souls were being added daily. So how is your conduct in the community? How is your speech? And how is your attitude? Now I want us to discuss occasions where we can implement good influence. During congregational events, gospel meetings, lecture programs, VBS, Friends and Family Day, Ladies Day, Folks, these type of events provide opportunity for us to invite those in the area. And it doesn't take much to say, would you like to come and join me this week? The church that I attend is, is having an event and I would like for you to be my guest. It doesn't take much to say. But you know, these things can be said with confidence if you're living right. You know, some people are, are afraid to invite other people because they know that they haven't been living right. So they don't even want to extend the invitation because they're afraid that they may be embarrassed. So they don't extend the invitation because they don't want to be embarrassed, because their behavior did not meet and did not line up with the word of God. But we can also, my friends, implement good influence during times of illness or death. See, during times like this, we can use these moments to show the heart of Christ, how he was compassionate, loving, and kind. We can do the same for those in the community. All we have to do, my friends, is keep our eyes and ears open. If you know someone that is sick or ill, let me encourage you to reach out to that individual. Write them a letter. Go and visit them. That's how you can implement good influence in the community. If you are aware that a coworker, friend, or neighbor just lost someone that they loved, send them a card. Let them know that you are praying for them during their time of grief. Church, these genuine gestures will help aid our influence as Christians. And let me tell you, sincere Christ-like gestures will lead to Bible studies. But we have to keep our eyes and ears open. If you know someone who's lost a loved one, if you know someone that is sick, ill, why not reach out to them? and let your light shine. A coworker who just lost a loved one, a neighbor who's grieving, write them a card. Let them know that you're there for them and that they can come to you at any time. That's how you influence the community. Capitalizing on opportunities that are given. And they're everywhere, believe me. We just have to keep our eyes open. And we have to seize those moments as Christians. Church, it is important that we guard our influence as Christians and make sure that we are using our influence in the community for God's glory. I want you to hear this poem. I am my neighbor's Bible. He reads me when he meets me. Today he reads me in my home, tomorrow in the street. He may be a relative or a friend or a slight acquaintance. He may not even know my name, yet he is reading me. Dear Christian friends and brothers, if we could only know how faithfully the world records just what we say and do, or we would make our record plain and labor hard to see. Our worldly neighbors won to Christ while reading you and me. Have you ever thought
that you could potentially be. The only Bible, if you will, that your neighbor sees on a daily basis or your coworker. You know, when I read this poem, I thought to myself, wow. So I could, that's all I could say. Wow. I am my neighbor's Bible. You are your neighbor's Bible. He reads you. He's reading you in your, in your home in the street, this may be a relative or a friend. He may not even know your name, but he's reading you. Folks, we have to start watching the way we live. we want to influence the community. If we want to win souls for Jesus, we must watch the way we live. So how are you living? How are you living on Monday? How are you living Friday? Saturday. You know, there are some Christians who live two different lives. You can't do that. There are some Christians who put on the mask on Sunday. But they take it off on Monday. And they go to work. And they don't apply anything right here. They're not effectual doers. They get around family members, friends, and some of the things that come out of their mouths, it's not Christ-like. If we want to impact this community, we have to be watchful of how we behave. 77,000, one church of Christ in Gastonia. And it starts with you because the world judges the church on the individual member. If you wear the name of Christ, live like a Christian. Do not live like the world. Let us pray. Father, I pray that as we leave this morning, um, that we will take to heart your word and that we will live as we should as Christians in this community. We know that we lived in a, in a crooked and perverse generation. There are those who do not believe there are those who do not even know. And I pray that our lives will reflect your image. Be with each and every one of us as we strive to, to live like you. Thank you so much for Jesus and the sacrifice that was made on the cross. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. If there is anyone here this evening who's been struggling with, with living right, don't hesitate to come forward for prayer. But if you have not been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, do so. The only way a person can receive forgiveness of sins it's through the watery graves of baptism. The Bible does not teach 
that your sins can be forgiven by saying the sinner's prayer. It's not in the Bible. You cannot have your sins forgiven by uttering a prayer. The only way you receive forgiveness according to scripture is through baptism. The Bible teaches that. Acts 2.38, 1 Peter 3.21. Baptism now saves you. If anyone has a need at this time, come forward as we stand and sing.